In a previous lecture, we talked about how to uh, calculate the work done by a force. It's a very simple process to do. You simply take the component of the force that is in the direction of the displacement and multiply by the displacement. If a force is in the direction of the displacement, it does positive work. If a force is opposite the direction of the displacement, it does negative work. Like energy, work is measured in joules because what work describes, what work does, is change the energy. In fact, I have a work energy theorem that says that the work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy. In that case, the work that is done is the sum total of all of the works that are done on an object. Because any object, as Newton's second law implies, any object can be subject to many forces all at once. And any force can do work in a given situation. But today what I'd like to do is to focus on the work done by two very special forces. The first is gravity. And the second is the work done by the force of a spring. These two forces are special when they do work because when we calculate the work, we notice a special kind of pattern uh, that happens. And that pattern, just like finding energy itself being a pattern of the nature of our universe, that pattern itself leads to a new kind of energy, potential energy. And so what I'm going to do here is calculate the work done by gravity. But I want to calculate the work done by gravity in three seemingly unique situations. Here are the three problems that I intend to solve. I have an object, presumably of mass m, here on the left that I'm going to allow to fall under the influence of gravity solely. Gravity is the only force that acts on it, and so it's free fall, and it falls a distance h to its final position. In the middle case, I'm going to take the very same mass and I'm going to allow it to slide down an incline, inclined at an angle theta. As that happens, the object is subject to more forces than just gravity, and the path that it takes from start to finish is different. The only thing that's the same about it is that it will, when it gets to the end, will have fallen the same height h. And then I have a really interesting problem uh, on the right, particularly interesting because it's a problem the likes of which I have never been able to solve before. The reason is obvious. As the object travels from the top to the bottom, still falling a height h, it travels along this crazy curved path that is very complicated, and in principle, I don't even know the math to describe that kind of path. Nevertheless, when the whole thing's said and done, the object has gone from a height h down to what I suppose is the ground level. In each one of these three cases, I would like to calculate how much work is done by the force of gravity. I'll begin on the left-hand side with the example of the work done by gravity in freefall. When an object falls under the influence of gravity, it's subject to just one force. So I've drawn it here like a free body diagram, the force mg directed downward. After it falls that height, it'll ultimately have a velocity v at the end, which perhaps I'd like to calculate. To get the work done by gravity in this motion, I go to my definition of work here. The work done by gravity is the parallel component of the force multiplied by the displacement. Well, as it happens in the case of this problem, the force of gravity is already parallel to the displacement. The displacement is downward, and the force of gravity is downward. So I'll simply replace F parallel with the force of gravity, mg, and delta x with delta y, because it's on the y-axis, if that makes you happy. Well, I realize that since it falls a height h, delta y is h the height that it falls under the influence of gravity. So I discover in this very simple case that the work done by gravity can be simply computed as m g h in joules. When I examine the second case, I see that it is immediately more complicated, simply because the free body diagram is more complicated. Here, the object is in contact with the incline that it slides down. 
I'm assuming that there's no friction here because that would simply, that wouldn't add anything to the discussion. It would give me something extra to talk about. So I have no friction force, but I do have a normal force directed perpendicular to the incline, which also affects the motion. I'm doing something familiar here in that I break the, the weight force down into its components perpendicular to and parallel to the incline, the parallel component being mg sine theta. When I say parallel component, that should set off a bell in your mind because work is only being done by forces that are parallel to the displacement. Here, the normal force is perpendicular to the displacement. By definition, that's how normal forces work. And therefore, the normal force does no work. mg cosine theta is similarly perpendicular to the incline, and therefore it does work. The only force that does work in this particular situation is mg sine theta, the component of the weight that's directed down the incline. So when I calculate the, and that is a component of gravity, so when I calculate the work done by gravity, that's equal to f parallel delta x. But here the parallel component is not mg, but in fact mg sine theta multiplied by the displacement down the incline. There's really no room for it on my diagram, but if I assume that the displacement down the incline is d, sort of the hypotenuse of that incline, then the work done by gravity is mg sine theta multiplied by d. I'll just do a little bit of rearrangement here to make an observation. If I move the position of the d so that the work done by gravity is mg times the quantity d sine theta, I see that d sine theta is something particular. Looking at my diagram, if d is the hypotenuse and theta is the angle shown in the diagram, then d times the sine of theta is the side opposite the angle. d times the sine of theta is equal to h. And very curiously, I discover that the work done by gravity in this case, just as in the last case, is mgh. What a stunning coincidence. The motions are very different, different forces doing the work, and yet the work done by gravity is the same in each case. What an interesting coincidence, except it's not a coincidence. The final case is a bit more challenging. Here I have the object rolling down this sort of arbitrarily shaped roller coastery hill. If I draw a free body diagram at any instant, it looks very much like the free body diagram for the inclined plane. The normal force is perpendicular, the components of the weight go as the components do. The troubling thing is that this free body diagram changes at every instant as the object rolls down the roller coaster. Sure, the component that is perpendicular to the displacement is mg sine theta, but what theta is changes at every instant. And this is not a problem. Um, that we have been able to solve yet, and for many of us, we don't have the mathematical tools available yet to solve it easily. So what I'm going to do is going to feel like a little bit of a cheat. Instead of going down the the roller coaster hill the way <clears throat> uh, I was going to say the way nature intended, what I'm going to do is start here at the top and move the ball horizontally. When I do that, I exert a force upward, perpendicular to the displacement. And the force of gravity is downward, perpendicular to the displacement. So as I move it from the initial position to the second position, no work is done. Once I do that, then I'll allow the object to fall, a height h1, until it reaches the, the track again. I'll then grab hold of it and move it horizontally doing no work until I reach the fourth position, and then I'll drop it, a height h2, and then repeat the process, moving it horizontally and dropping it, a height h3, getting from the top to the bottom, with work being done by gravity. I then will make the claim that the work done by gravity is equal to the work done in the first drop plus the work done in the second drop plus the work done in the third drop. So, since I know how much work is done by gravity when I drop a thing, then work one 
is MGH1, and work 2 is MGH2, and work 3 is MGH3. So the work done by gravity is the sum of the works. Factoring out Mg, I see that it's Mg times H1 plus H2 plus H3. Well, that's the sum of the heights. H1 plus H2 plus H3 is clearly just H, and so I find that the work done by gravity is once again equal to MGH. Well, at this point you should cry out, Professor, you've cheated me. Uh, because that's not the actual path that it takes, you see. You went sideways and downward and sideways and downward. It looks like Lego bricks. And the motion of the object itself is, in fact, smooth motion from the top to the bottom. And that is the real motion that needs to be described. So, sure, you've got MGH as the answer, but you cheated along the way. Well, I have a remedy for that. I'll do it again. But this time, I'll do it in much smaller steps. You see, those big chunky steps are what are worrying you. So instead, I'll go over just a little bit and then down a little bit and over a little bit and then down a little bit and then over a little bit and down a little bit and over a little, down a little, over a little, over a little, over. And I'll do it over and over and over again. And so you see, when I go from the top to the bottom, I'm going to go down a bunch of steps. In fact, in this case, I go down 11 steps in order to get there. And so now, uh, you see, it follows along better the curve of the thing. It seems a bit more reasonable. And you say, well, well, yeah, but it's still a cheat. I mean, sure, it looks like it's a little bit closer, but you've done it in 11 steps and it still looks like it's made out of Legos. Well, consider this in your mind. Every time I make the size of the step smaller, the approximation to the actual result gets better and better and better. Imagine that I make it out of uh, Legos that are so tiny they're microscopic. Well, then at that point, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the approximation and the actual hill itself, which has a molecular structure. So if I do it in a large number of steps, it seems like it would eventually be exactly equal to the value that I'm looking for. We express it mathematically this way. The work done by gravity is equal to the sum. Capital sigma here means a sum. Some of you may have encountered this in math class. The sum the index i goes from 1 to 11 of the work done in the ith step is equal to mg times the sum of all the heights, which of course is the height. So with 11 steps or 3 steps or however many steps that I want to do, I still end up with mgh because the sum is still going to be the sum of a number of heights that always adds up to h. So imagine that I do it this way. The work done by gravity is equal to mg times the sum i equals 1 to infinity. I do it in an infinite number of steps so that I get infinite smoothness of the curve. And you might make an argument, say, well, what is infinity? Does that exist or whatever? Well, it's as big as you can possibly imagine times the biggest number that you can possibly imagine. It is an extraordinarily large number of individual steps, making each step infinitesimally small. Well, when I make that argument, it doesn't show whether you like the idea of infinity or not. It doesn't change the fact that that very, very large number of heights is still going to add up to the height h. And so I find in this very peculiar case that the work done by gravity is exactly equal to mgh. By doing this exercise, I've discovered a very remarkable thing. In each one of these three cases, the work done by gravity is the same, mgh, 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 which is a result that I would not have initially expected because these three objects take remarkably different paths to get where they're going. The first one goes straight down, the second one goes straight down at an angle, and the third one does a crazy roller coaster path. They all take different paths to get where they're going, but the work done by gravity is the same independent of path. This makes gravity special among forces. The force of friction would not have done this. Um, if I included friction, it, for example, in this, this partic in this particular argument, in the first case there's no friction, in the second case there's friction, in the third case the friction is, varies as it goes along. So the work done by friction would be different in all three of these cases. But here, the work done by gravity is the same in each case. Gravity here is special. For reasons that will become apparent a little bit later on, we refer to gravity as 
a conservative force. Uh, but that name is a little bit mysterious right now. It'll take a little bit more understanding before we get why that makes sense. But for the moment, we recognize that gravity is special because the work that it does is independent of path. All that matters is the height that uh, an object uh, travels, either up or down. Uh, and the work done by gravity would be equal to mgh. I mentioned earlier that calculating the work done by gravity had something to do with wanting to know the speed that an object travels. Indeed, it does. In each one of these cases, the work done by gravity is mgh, and it's the only work that's done. So if I apply the work energy theorem and say that the work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy, that's the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. If I release the thing from rest, then the initial kinetic energy is equal to zero. And so mgh, the work done by gravity, is equal to one-half mv squared. The m's cancel, and I can solve for the speed. I find a result that is actually going to become very familiar to you, that is that the speed is equal to the square root of 2gh. In each one of these cases, the speed of the object when it reaches the low level is the same in each case. That's a rather remarkable result that you might not have guessed at. Um, the speeds are exactly the same. Now, the velocities are not the same. In the case on the left, the free fall case, the object is traveling straight down, and so its vector direction is downward. In the middle case, it's going in the direction of the incline, which is different from downward. And in the roller coaster case, it's going whatever direction that happens to point, tangent to the curve at the bottom of the thing. So the velocities are all different. The vector directions are all different. But the magnitude of the velocity, in this case, the speed, are all the same because the work done by gravity in each one of these cases is the same. That makes gravity special, and that makes it possible for us to define a new kind of energy. In the context of gravity, this new kind of energy, potential energy, is naturally termed gravitational potential energy. I'll define it in the simple context, the simplest problem that I can imagine, lifting an object. When I have an object, like a, a book, sitting on a classroom table, and I want to lift it a height h, how much work is done by gravity? Well, the work done by gravity is equal to the force of gravity, mg, multiplied by the displacement, delta y. But I have a negative sign here. The reason why is that when I lift a book off the table, the displacement is upward, and the force is downward, which means gravity is doing negative work. Now, by definition, what we choose to do as scientists is define potential energy in the following way. The work done by a conservative force, like gravity, special force, the work done by a conservative force is equal to the negative of the change of the potential energy. That is to say, as I lift the book up, gravity does negative work, but the potential energy increases. Why does the potential energy increase? Because that's the way I want it to be. I mean, I, I choose that. So that when I lift a book up, it gains potential energy. And then when I release the book and it falls, that potential energy is transformed into kinetic energy. So I want it uh, just so my description works out nice, neat, and tidy. So the work done by a conservative force is equal to the negative of the change of the potential energy. So here, the negative of the change of the potential energy would be equal to the negative of mg delta y. Well, naturally, the negatives cancel, and that's what I wanted. So that the change in the potential energy of the book is equal to mg delta y, where delta y is the vertical displacement. Well, any delta quantity, like delta y, is going to be y final minus y initial, which means this is mg y minus mg naught. Here's a tricky bit. I can choose zero to be wherever I like. So if I choose the initial position to be equal to zero, then the change in gravitational potential energy when I lift the book is simply mgy. You have to be careful here because it makes it seem like you can choose gravitational potential energy to be whatever you like because you can choose the height to be zero wherever you like. The reason why that this is okay is because it's not the gravitational potential energy itself that's interesting. 
The interest is in the change in gravitational potential energy. When gravitational potential energy changes from one value to another, that's going to turn out to be the useful thing. So it's okay to choose the height wherever you want when using the gravitational potential energy to solve problems. Two important uh, things here. The first is, once you choose where the height is zero, you can't change your mind about that in the middle of solving a problem. That's a rather obvious one. That's a strict rule. You can't do that. Once you choose, you've chosen for that problem solution. The second thing is just a recommendation on my part. When I'm solving problems involving gravitational potential energy, I always choose the zero height to be the lowest point uh, in the problem. That way, I never have negative heights. Is it okay to have negative heights? Absolutely it is. And therefore, it's okay to have negative gravitational potential energy. But having negative signs wandering around in your problem solutions is generally a bad idea. So, uh, that's just a little bit worried about the coordinate system. But choosing the initial height of the book to be equal to zero, and the final uh, position of the book to be the height that I lift it to, the gravitational potential energy is equal to mgh. So now, along with kinetic energy, I have another form of energy, potential energy, in its gravitational form. I'm not done yet, because I'd like to be able to solve even more interesting problems. It turns out that gravity is not the only force that has this wonderful property. There are many others. For the purposes of this course, I'm just going to add one more. The force exerted by springs can do work. And it turns out that the force exerted by a spring has the same interesting property as gravity. When we first began our discussion of Newton's second law, I had provided a list of forces that I needed to identify so that we could solve problems. Uh, and on that list of forces, I had a few that uh, were a bit fanciful, like viscous drag force. Uh, but one in particular, I said, was a force that we would need later on, but that we weren't going to do in Newton's second law. Well, here we are. It's later on. And I'm referring to the force exerted by a spring. A spring is exactly what you think it is. It's a coiled bit of metal that you might find inside of your pen or inside um, a clock or in the suspension of an automobile, a coiled bit of metal. And when you stretch it, it exerts a force. When you compress it, it exerts a force. Coiled bits of metal like that as springs are very, very familiar to look at. There are other things that qualify as springs. For example, if I just have a strip of metal that when I bend it, it springs back to its original um, uh, configuration, that also could be considered a spring. And what I'd like to do is calculate the work done by the spring force, because as it happens, it has the same interesting property as the force of gravity. The trouble is, I never actually defined what the spring force was. There's an equation for calculating it, but I never derived that equation or described it in any way. And as it happens, that force has features that matter to calculating the work done. So our very first step here is to define the spring force. And then once we define the spring force, then we'll calculate the spring work and we'll see what we get as a result. In order to understand the spring force, We'll do a little experiment first. I have here in a simulation two springs. The two springs are identical. Um, the springs are here because uh, I'm using a simulation called a FET. I'm at the mercy of the FET, so I have to use these two springs here. I have to improvise a little bit. But here I have these two springs. They're coiled bits of metal, and they're identically the same. So I get to use both of them uh, together. Now, a spring has a certain length. Uh, but these two springs are unstretched. They haven't been drawn away. So we say that they're at their um, equilibrium position, their natural length, which is right there. That's the point at which the spring is unstretched. So right now, I say that these two springs are exerting zero force uh, <clears throat> at this equilibrium position. So what I'm going to do is take a 50-gram weight and I'm going to hang a 50 gram weight on the end of the spring. Now, as a result, that 50 gram weight is going to bring the pull the spring down. 
and stretch it away from its equilibrium position. The reason why is that as a spring gets stretched, the force that it exerts increases until I reach a point where the spring is in equilibrium and comes to rest like this. Um, it comes to rest at a new position, and that position that I'm interested in, I have a, a marker here that I can use to locate that position. That's how far the spring stretches when I hang 50 grams from it. Um, and so 50 grams has a certain weight. I want you to imagine here a free body diagram. The weight directed downward and the spring force directed upward. Since the 50 grams is hanging there in forced equilibrium, that means that the um, that the force that the spring force exerted upward is equal to the weight force directed downward. So now I know with this spring that when I stretch it that far, I get that much force. Here's the interesting point. Look what happens when I hang 100 grams to the same spring. Here's the same spring again with 100 grams attached. When I release it and let it come to rest, I find that its new equilibrium position is exactly the same distance below the 50 gram that the 50 gram is below the equilibrium position. That is, when I double the force that I exert on the spring, the spring force doubles and the stretch of the spring doubles as well. I can see it even further, and it would be great if I had a 200 gram mass in this simulation. Unfortunately, they don't provide me with that, but they do provide me, wait a second, maybe they do. What is this mystery one? Ooh, look at that. Now this mystery one's not labeled. I assure you, it is 200 grams. And it has once again stretched the spring the same distance further from equilibrium. So the idea here is that when I double the force, I double the stretch. When I triple the force, I triple the stretch. It seems to me from this basic experiment that there's a linear relationship between the force that I exert on a spring and the stretch of the spring from its equilibrium position. In order to express this spring force as an equation, we have to make a graph of the spring force that I get as a function of how far I stretch the spring. So here's my little drawing of my mass hanging from a spring. <clears throat> and I have a free body diagram where the weight that I hang from it is directed downward and the spring force is directed upward. This is how I can experimentally determine how much spring force there is. Because when it hangs in equilibrium, it's just hanging there, the spring force upward must be equal to the weight downward. So imagine an experiment where I hang a little bit of weight and then more weight and more weight and more weight and more weight. Each time I measure the stretch of the spring. If I made a graph of the force exerted by the spring as a function of how far I stretch it, which I'm calling x or delta x, displacement of the spring from its equilibrium position, however you want to look at it, that graph would be experimentally a line. That line has a slope to it. So that slope, I want to calculate, and I know that the slope of a line is the rise of the line over the run of the line. Well, here, the rise of the line is a certain uh, change in force that I get, delta F. When I stretch the spring, a certain amount of stretch, delta X. So the slope is delta F over delta X. This slope is given the symbol lowercase k, not uppercase k. Uppercase k is kinetic energy. Lowercase k is the spring constant of the spring. Uh, and obviously the units of the spring constant, which I didn't indicate here and I should have, the units of the spring constant would be newtons per meter because it's delta F in newtons in the numerator and delta x in meters in the denominator. When you solve problems, you'll see a lot of um, displacements in centimeters because uh, it's not reasonable to imagine a spring that gets stretched for meters and meters. You always have to convert those centimeters to meters. Remember, all of our physics is done in meters, kilograms, and seconds. So the equation of my experimental data is the equation of a line. 
y equals mx plus b, where on the y-axis I have the force exerted by a spring, f sub s. And uh, that's equal to negative the spring constant multiplied by delta x. The negative sign is there simply to indicate that if I pull a spring downward, the force is upward. If I push a spring upward, the force is downward. If I pull a spring to the left, the force is to the right. If I push a spring to the right, the force is to the left. That is, the spring force is always opposite the direction of the displacement. So here it is, just making it official. The force exerted by a spring, which like all forces, is a vector, is equal to the negative of the spring constant multiplied by delta x, which is a vector. The negative sign is there because the force is always opposite the direction of the displacement. The spring force here has a particular feature, though, that's important to make you understand why we didn't use it in our Newton's second law unit. When an object connected to a spring moves around, the force exerted by the spring changes. If you think about all of the problems involving force that you've solved thus far. In every case, the force was constant. It didn't change when you were in the middle of trying to solve a problem. So the spring constant <clears throat> is a more complicated force than any other that we've encountered thus far. That makes calculating the work done by the spring force a little bit tricky. The reason why is that in order to calculate the work done by the spring, I want to calculate the force of the spring multiplied by delta x, because that's how I calculate work, force times displacement. But when I calculate the work done by gravity, I simply took the force of gravity multiplied by the displacement. When I do the force of spring, which spring force should I use? The spring force is different as I stretch a spring. Here's the graph of the spring force as a function of displacement. Before I've stretched the spring, there's no spring force at all. And then as I stretch it, the spring force increases, 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 increases until it reaches a maximum value at the maximum stretch. So which value of the force should I use? Well, because the spring force is a linear law, I have the luxury of using the average force when I calculate the work done by a spring. So what I'm going to do is say that the average force, just the way I calculate every average, I need two numbers and divide by two. I'm going to take the maximum value of the spring force, which I call Fs max, plus the minimum value of the spring force, which is zero, divided by two. So it's really the maximum spring force divided by two. I'm going to call the maximum displacement from equilibrium x and use the average force to calculate how much work is done by the spring. So the work done by the spring is the average spring force multiplied by the displacement. Well, the average spring force is one half, so I have a factor of one half out in front. The spring, the maximum possible spring force, which is negative kx, multiplied by the maximum stretch, which is x, the displacement from equilibrium at the end of the stretch. Well, this is a little bit sloppy. I should group these terms together. I'll bring the negative sign out in front and realize that I have x times x, which is x squared. So I very easily calculated the work done by the average spring force, and I found that it's equal to negative 1 half kx squared. I'm not surprised that that negative sign is there, indicating that the spring does negative work. Because negative work is done when the force is applied opposite of the displacement. And that's exactly what a spring does. It exerts a force in the direction opposite the direction that you stretch it. Just as the work done by gravity depends only on the change in height, the work done by a spring depends only on the spring stretch. It doesn't depend on what happens in between. In this way, a spring force is the same kind of special force, a conservative force, just like the force of gravity. I defined in this lecture that the work done by a conservative force is equal to the negative of the change of the potential energy. So I'm going to say that the change in the spring potential energy is equal to the negative of the work done by the spring. But of course, I just found 
that the work done by the spring is negative one half kx squared. And that means that the change in the potential energy of a spring is equal to one half kx squared. I'm going to do something very obvious and say that since the change in the potential energy of the spring would be the final spring energy minus the initial spring energy, I'm going to say that when a spring is unstretched, it has no energy. That is, when the position of the springs, uh, the end of the spring is at the equilibrium position, x is equal to zero, the energy is equal to zero, and I'll strike that off, and I get my final result. Yet another form of potential energy. We only have one kinetic energy, one-half mv squared, but as it happens, we have two potential energies, the gravitational potential energy, and now the spring potential energy, one-half kx squared. So here's a little summary of things as they stand now. I know how to calculate the work done by a force. It's the parallel component of the force multiplied by the displacement. Work can be positive or work can be negative, depending on whether the force is in the direction of the displacement or opposite the direction of displacement. There are three forms of energy that I can calculate. The kinetic energy, one-half mv squared. The gravitational potential energy, mgh and the spring potential energy, one-half kx squared. Determining how much energy a physical system ha happens to have is a really easy task. Ask yourself, is it moving? If it is, it has kinetic energy. Does it have a height above zero? If it does, it has gravitational potential energy. Is there a spring, and if so, is that spring stretched or compressed from its equilibrium? If so, then the system has spring potential energy. As it happens, a physical system, including the ones that we're going to investigate and solve problems um, regarding, can have any combination of these types of energy at any instant in time. The situation's always evolving as one form of energy is transformed into another form of energy during a physical process. It turns out we're not done observing the patterns of nature here. There's still one more really profound um, idea that we need. But for right now, we've accomplished the task for today. That was to identify the existence of a new form of energy, potential energy, and to calculate two kinds of potential energy, the gravitational potential energy and the spring potential energy.